Welcome to the January MENA market briefing with the Refinitiv Oil Research team here in Dubai. As of January 2022, oil market fundamentals remain tight and the political risk premium on crude oil is growing. This is creating conditions whereby $100 Brent does seem like a viable target for the first time in seven years. However, that would still appear to be an unsustainable price level. Today, I'm joined by lead oil analyst, Sudarshan Sarathi, and we're going to examine a few fundamental factors driving price action in crude futures today. So stay with us. Now, Brent is back to and has broken through its pre-Omicron highs. Global markets are largely shrugging off the impact of Omicron, and oil is no exception. Energy agencies' estimates indicate that global supply and demand balances have the market in a supply deficit. On the, on the issue of regulated supply, uh, key OPEC members are not accelerating production increases and others are struggling to raise production at all. Major importers, such as the US, China and Japan, uh, they're actually releasing barrels from their strategic reserves can contain rising energy prices. And as a consequence of the imbalance, Global inventories are low and continue to withdraw for the time being at least. So this creates conditions for price spikes because the market is highly sensitive supply outages. And this is amplified again by the steep backwardation, which means traders are light on inventories and therefore forward supply. And this all adds to the political risk premium and it is exemplified by the latest pipeline outage in Turkey, uh, which has cut off crude supply in the Mediterranean, if only temporarily. So based on that narrative and those factors, it would appear that oil bears are pretty much in hibernation right now. And uh, meanwhile, the bulls are targeting the $100 level. Now we can see the bullish sentiment in the latest commitment of traders here uh, for ice Brent futures. And hedge funds have rebuilt their long positions following on from the Omicron route in December. Uh, now this is one of many bullish sentiment indicators which all seem to be flashing green at the moment. However, net longs in oil are actually relatively low historically speaking. You know, given the market sentiment right now, you might expect to see more exposure from money managers. Um, open interest in the contracts does seem to be lower. And I wonder if this might be because producers are not hedging production uh, maybe because they have a, a, a bullish outlook as well, and therefore there's a lack of counterparts in the marketplace to support more long positions from the managed money sector. Alternatively, you know, the argument may be that hedge funds are putting capital elsewhere. And if that is the case, you may wonder if there is room for higher capital inflow through 2022, uh, particularly in the stock markets or if the stock markets fade from current levels and commodities offer uh, some sort of inflation hedge or maybe better returns. Um, I don't know, Sudarshan, if you have any thoughts, particularly on, on trader positioning at the moment and, and uh, you know, the, the appeal perhaps among hedge funds uh, in the context of other asset classes. Now, you brought an interesting point, Tim, on the fact that probably the managed money does not have enough funds to pump into you know, the contracts. It could, it could be a possibility. And uh, I think going forward, uh, if there is going to be significant inflation and the Fed is forced to, um, to start tightening the policy, monetary policy, it would mean that the funds will have to start looking outside of risky assets and they will probably look to go back to, you know, treasury bonds, et cetera, which would offer them better returns, which will further reduce capital available for them to take on speculative oil positions. So I, I think going forward, it's going to be even more tricky for the funds to, uh, to kind of enter speculative positions if the inflation persists. Okay, interesting. So potentially, yeah, uh, uh, maybe, maybe, the, maybe the feeling among hedge funds that uh, the, the commodity surge has, has run its course, but we'll, we'll discuss it more and discuss the fundamentals uh, for right now, in fact. So I think the EIA, as well as other agencies, uh, they're pretty much broadly aligned on the idea that a market surplus is around the corner. 
But we've been following this data for some time now on this segment, right? And uh, we seem to be stuck in this very long and protracted transition whereby the supply deficit lingers and the surplus is kicked ever further down the road. So these charts I showed a couple of months ago and obviously updated, and we've got September versus January forecasts here from the EIA. So if you pay attention particularly to the third quarter and fourth quarter of 2021 bars, what they show uh, is a deeper supply deficit in the January estimates, which is the left-hand chart versus September uh, on the right-hand side. So that adjustment has been happening consistently throughout the second half of 2021 with rebalancing uh, in supply and demand consistently pushed back month after month. So you've got to kind of ask the question, what might actually be behind that? Um, now, in his latest report, the EIA quotes uncertainty around Omicron and the impact on economic growth, uh, as well as winter energy demand as sort of question marks and uncertainties in their forecasts. And on the supply side, you've got key drivers, which include the OPEC plus production policy and, and the rate of addition to the US rig count. On the topic of demand uncertainty, I think everyone on the planet is familiar with this data set. Um, you know, global markets, as we saw in the Brent chart, sold off in December when, Omic when the Omicron variant emerged. And of all the asset classes, oil was potentially uh, showed the oil potentially showed the deepest retreat, falling around 16% off the highs. Now, as we've seen, the markets have quickly shrugged off those concerns, and we're back testing and uh, testing those resistance levels in oil anyway, and, and moving through them. So, on the COVID numbers, uh, you know, this, this these case numbers suggest that we are in a new phase of the pandemic. So most important to note, I think, is that you know, recent UK data show that hospitalization, hospitalization risk um, of Omicron uh, compared to Delta is about one third, um, which is actually very positive news, news um, and a very positive development uh, given the context. Um, it may be argued, therefore, that the case numbers are also reflective of social attitudes towards the virus. You know, they're obviously changing, we're getting used to it. And then we also potentially have the reluctance of governments these days to impose any draconian containment measures. Um, and that ultimately is supportive of economic activity and oil demand. And then we can see there in the bottom chart, that's important, it shows airline capacity in terms of passenger seats, as courtesy of OAG. Um, now the yellow line shows 2022 data versus the blue line, which is pre-COVID 2019 numbers. Um, now, the delta between the two appears to have widened slightly in December and January. Uh, that probably accounts for the Omicron developments, but it seems to be recovering relatively quickly and narrows again um, from March onwards. So I'd say that's, generally speaking, uh, a pretty positive indicator in terms of how, you know, on a practical basis, uh, markets and society are dealing with, with the Omicron outbreak and uh, suggests certainly that economic activity and oil demand is relatively robust going forwards. Uh, so the Shen, you might want to chime in because I know you have a, have a view on, uh, on the COVID cases and, uh, and its impact on, on oil prices itself. You know, uh, the, the fact that you spoke about social attitudes uh, and was, a, was a very interesting one because I personally have been surprised by, by the lack of, uh, you know, um, a, a kind of a serious attitude towards Omicron. And uh, in general, I've noticed people just assuming that, okay, it's yet another variant. This pandemic is bound to like remain in our lives and let's get on with the way we've always lived. Travel around, meet people, socialize. And I, I think gradually, have reached a certain mindset wherein uh, unless there's going to be a significant health impact uh, like increased hospitalizations or uh, you know in increasing um, death rate etc I don't think people are going to be too worried till that happens um, and right now Omicron is just seen as yet another flu season uh, impact uh, or, but that's how um, the general interaction with people I've spoken to has been, which brings me to the kind of belief that um, 
and with the kind of data we've seen till now on, on fuel demand in different countries uh, makes me believe that uh, this impact is indeed going to be short lived and that's pretty much what the opec plus has been claiming for a very long time they've been saying that the omicron impact is something that they don't expect to you know be persistent they expect it to be a, a small impact and a short impact and i tend to agree with that Absolutely. Have you seen any other data sets? Might confirm it. I don't know. I know you uh, tend to keep an eye on mobility data and these kind of things. And anything particular in, in any of the key demand centers for oil, maybe uh, US, India, China, perhaps? Well, till, till uh, about recently, US demand for uh, fuel was strong. It, it was only in the last week or so that the demand seemed to have started to look like it was a bit shaky. Uh, in India, fuel demand till December was good. It was only the first fortnight of January where the numbers, again, uh, it's too premature to comment, but the numbers might uh, might start to show that uh, there is some sort of a slowdown. Uh, but having said that, uh, I think the Omicron impact started sometime in November. And even in December, we've seen people pretty much uh, going about their lives. And uh, unless governments enforce strict norms, which till date, most countries have not enforced, they've kept things relatively open and preferred to have more localized lockdowns because that's more healthy for the economy rather than shutting down entire cities or entire countries. Just focus on on like districts or like sectors where there are high case counts and try to like optimize your economic activity. Yeah. Uh, I think as that keeps happening, I, I don't suspect demand to take a major impact. What could impact demand could be the high prices because in some countries, inflation is already significantly high. And if prices continue to remain high, the, the end consumer might start to feel a pinch on his pocket and might start spending lesser. So that could be an impact. I don't think people uh, have started reducing their driving or their traveling because of Omicron. Yeah, I think it's definitely a fact to watch. I think as soon as we hit 80 uh, or even 70, you know, that, that question that you, you're bringing up, not only inflation, but it's demand the elasticity, right? Um, and, and when does that start to, to play, play into world demand, but also into, into OPEC policy and uh, how they go about managing prices. So, so we'll shift over to that side of the discussion now and factor in the supply equation, uh, which is, you know, which is dominated by market management um, by OPEC plus uh, and its production policy. So, you know, just a recap of, of, of what that is, what OPEC production policy actually is. Um, you know, OPEC plus is a collective, it continues to operate under supply restraints. Uh, in August 2021, you know, began unwinding 5.8 million barrels per day in production cuts, right? Uh, each month is raising production ceiling by 400,000 barrels per day. And I think by the end of January, uh, the group is left with about 3.4 million barrels per day of cuts yet to unwind, which takes us all the way through uh, to September uh, later this year. Now, as the data shows here, uh, OPEC is still over complying with those production cuts. And in November, I think as a collective, OPEC plus production was about 650,000 barrels per day below target. Now that's the number that was recently released by the International Energy Agency. Um, while major Middle East producers are more or less on target, we can see that the West Africa producers are struggling to raise output. And we discussed this actually not long ago uh, on this segment again. Um, Meanwhile, you've got other members who, who are exempt from cuts, namely Libya, Iran, and Venezuela, but for various reasons, actually unable to raise the production there. So we can just take a look at a couple of these countries in a little bit more focus. The top line there, we've got West Africa, Angola and Nigeria, both producing way below their baseline, which is the gray and production there in the blue. Um, I think this is probably, uh, one of the major factors uh, behind the November shortfall, again, 650 KBD, uh, that was reported or estimated by the IEA. And then we go to the bottom line there, that's alternative OPEC supplies, uh, 
in some respects. Uh, Libyan production doesn't seem to be rising. Uh, it's proven capacity for 1.2 million barrels per day, but maintaining that level is something uh, of a challenge and appears to be problematic. Security issues result in regular supply disruptions there, as we saw this month, in fact, when I believe blockades resulted in partial shut-ins uh, to the tune of about 700, well, lowered production, sorry, to around 750,000 barrels a day. That's about 30% of capacity. Uh, I think we might back up online there now. Um, but what it means is essentially uh, Libya is an unreliable source of additional or alternative supply. And the same is true of Venezuela, uh, not the world's largest oil reserves, I think, on, uh, on paper anyway. Uh, and due to sanctions, output has been challenged for a long time. There's been a recent pop in exports, I believe, and that's down to the arrival of Iranian diluents, uh, which has helped mobilize heavier crude grades for export. And then Iran itself, uh, arguably the only other potential source of readily available crude with, uh, within the OPEC plus organization anyway, with an estimated 1 million barrels per day in capacity off the market due, of course, to Iranian sanctions. And uh, given the price context, we kind of understand why China recently increased its overt, um, or dip, overt diplomatic support for Iran by opposing or criticizing US unilateral sanctions. Um, but I think we're still a long way from a breakthrough on that front and, uh, and a return of Iranian barrels. Um, so the way I see it now, you know, in the context of OPEC plus, it's really down to Saudi Iraq and the UAE uh, to tap into spare capacity, which is to the tune of around 5 million barrels per day worth of, of untapped supply there in order to address uh, the supply deficit that we've seen in recent months and is still present, but we are expected to shift out of and transist out of today. Um, but to my mind, it's really a question of political pressure and political will to, to address that. And uh, they've withstood calls from some of the major importers, some of the major clients, um, to accelerate uh, the return of supply and reduce those production cuts um, as things stand. And uh, Sudarshan, again, like you're watching the Middle East yourself, um, what's your take on OPEC strategy at the moment? And, uh, you know, maybe where do things stand? What might be their end game? Do you, do you see uh, them introducing any further, further supply to the market uh, ahead of schedule, perhaps? Uh, that's a good question. And before I get to that, uh, there's one thing that I wanted to draw your attention to. The, the fact that you had highlighted about Libya and you know, the fact that a lot of these security issues lead to frequent outages. I've worked in an upstream oil and gas company, and I can say with some conviction that in, in a conventional oil field, uh, shale is different, but in a conventional oil field, if the wells get shut down quite frequently, that could leave lead uh, it to a long-term impact on the productivity of the well. So it loses its, uh, you know, if you had an original planned production capacity, um, through the course of time, it will start gradually declining. You will reach uh, depletion much faster than you had anticipated, which, which is what I think will eventually happen to countries like Libya. If they keep facing frequent outages, it would, uh, it would reduce, okay, you will have a theoretical capacity, but on paper, uh, what you have will not be seen on your actual production, which would necessitate more investment requirement. Uh, and I, I think for all the three, all the four countries actually on the charts that you've put over here, uh, the biggest issue has been attracting consistent investment. And um, for West African producers, I think going forward with a lot of the major oil companies shifting focus towards renewables, they will find it even more difficult to attract players to come and invest in their uh, deep water offshore assets. So that is going to be a, a further challenge for these countries over the long run. Okay, one is we are going to face short-term price spikes because of production not being ramped up as quickly as demand has moved. But over the longer period of time, I think this is going to be a significant point of concern for all oil market participants. Um, having said that, coming back to the OPEC and especially the Middle East producers, uh, I personally feel two things. One, I feel is that by delaying 
the volume increased despite consistent requests from consumer nations. I think the OPEC plus is, is kind of giving a message to the market that we've always been right about where we see the market. We've been saying demand was weak initially, and now we've been saying demand is robust. Um, and we also believe that, uh, you know, investment is required in this sector. You just cannot isolate the oil sector and just move towards a fully renewable future. You need to have a mixture of both. I think that's the kind of messaging they want to give out to the market. Um, personally, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and to some extent, even Iraq might be willing to increase their exports as much as possible. Uh, I think we've already seen increased exports coming in from Saudi and the UAE. Uh, and I think that should keep continuing as a trend. But what it would mean is that their own spare capacity would be pretty crunched. And uh, like we pointed out earlier, any geopolitical event would mean that the, the price spike could be quite significant. Right, there's no real incentive though to maintain that so-called spare capacity and not bring it on, online, especially in this current price environment. And this is a, a call for the market to do so. I mean, what's the sense in this situation in, in withholding withholding those barrels and particularly when we're talking about estimated reserves of around five million barrels per day of, of capacity that might be there all right we take into account that how accessible that is uh, it, it depends on infrastructure issues and, and drilling issues i suppose but then the deficit the supply deficit in the marketplace is what 500 kbd maybe a million barrels per day on, on you know in in the event of an outage uh, they should have the necessary flexibility to bring that online, but it's a really, like I brought up earlier, a matter of will and the reluctance to do so. And... No, I, th I think a um, couple of things there. One is, um, I, I, I don't see it as a reluctance to bring the volume online. I think it's a reluctance to bring it immediately. There has been a gradual ramp up, at least from the top Middle East producers. We've, we've seen that in the export numbers also. So that is definitely happening. I think they're more wary of bringing all the volume, you know, immediately, which could again, you know, flood the market. I think they are happy with where the prices are going, trending, and they, they wouldn't want to upset that. So it would be a more gradual, uh, you know, bringing back of the supply from their side. And the other point is, I think, as producers or even as uh, people who look to bring balance to the market, I think the Middle Eastern OPEC producers are more focused on the longer run and where they see supply coming from and the capacity additions, et cetera, uh, which is why if you see there has been enough activity happening, uh, say for example, within UAE, there have been multiple finds of new oil that has been discovered in the last one, one year and especially in the last six months. Uh, all of it expected to significantly add to the Murban production. Uh, similarly, Saudi Arabia had announced a couple of oil finds last year. So they have consistently been investing in, you know, not just like maintaining the reserves at current levels, but they have specified targets to reach. Um, like for example, the UAE wishes to, you know, look at a 5 million barrel per day production capacity by the end of 2030. So th they, they are working towards that. And I think their goal is more on the medium to long term. I think they believe in the short run, things will manage by themselves and they're gradually raising production. Their concern is more on the longer run. Yeah, anyway, so go move towards inventories now. And, um, but it's interesting that you say, I mean, you have that long-term objective. I wonder if that objective is again to build market share. I mean, let's not forget that the price cycle shifted for, for oil shifted in 2014 uh, with that, so, you know, with that almost attack and that attempt to, to put shale out of business. But in these market conditions, as we see them with prices so high, fair enough, you've got the, you've got the low stocks, you've got the back, you've got the backward dated market, which perhaps makes hedging a little bit more difficult, but then there's a price incentive for US drillers to increase their, in, increase their rig count, which they're doing relatively slowly but yet to increase uh, supply and potentially be that flexible reducer to shift that market share. I mean, doesn't that kind of almost 
challenge the idea of efforts from, from the UAE and other OPEC members to, to increase their supply and increase their sales going forward. So it's really a question of OPEC strategy. Is, the, is it just now a case of supporting prices for the short term? I mean, how do you achieve that sort of market share in the long term? Balance that out. Yeah, I think if you if you look at the the inventories chart, like uh, we we've been speaking about this over reports and you know during other fora, um, inventories have been consistently being drawn because of the price scenario. The OPEC has been successful in maintaining a backwardated market, which doesn't really support any storage of oil. And if you look at the chart on the left, you can also see that the SPR stocks in the US have also been falling. Uh, for people who are not aware, SPR stands for Strategic Petroleum Reserves, or reserves of oil that a country maintains just to deal with um, any unforeseen supply side issues, uh, which in the case of US, US has used it to also like moderate prices at times of uh, high price scenarios. Uh, which currently has been kind of the last resort for the uh, President Biden's administration. They've tried pressurizing the OPEC plus to increase supply, but the OPEC plus has stuck to where um, their policy has been, which le which has kind of left the US to focus on bringing out the oil from their storage. Uh, they have done it um, already in around or so, and they are planning to continue bringing out as much oil as possible to bring down prices. They also reached out to other other consumer nations such as India, South Korea, China, Japan, uh, especially in the Asia to like try and see if a coordinated release of stocks from SPS can be a strategy that consumers can undertake to bring down prices. Uh, they they found some success in convincing people. Japan agreed. I think China has been the most recent country to agree, and they've. Uh, I think reports claim that they are looking to bring out some quantity during the the Chinese New Year time. Uh, India has also agreed to like release some stocks from the SPR. However. It has not impacted prices quite significantly. It, it it did probably impact for a day or two, but then prices move back because the, the more stocks you deplete from your storage and you bring it into the market, the, the lesser you have to deal with contingencies. Uh, what happens if a, if a major supply source gets taken out due to some event? Uh, like we are noticing in the last couple of weeks, we've seen Kazakhstan face issues, we've seen Libya face issues. So the market is starting to price in this fact that inventory globally in, in, in almost all the developed countries and in developing countries has been falling quite significantly. Uh, we've seen VLCC floating storage also fall. The only exception to this, and I'd probably get to that in a minute, would be commercial storage in uh, independent refiners in China. But that has been a different reason altogether. But if you look at it as a trend, we've seen inventories falling and with supply kind of uh, slow to catch up with demand, you're running a risk. And that's where like what we wanted to bring out as a highlight in this recording is going to be the market risk premium. So geopolitical events would be more keenly observed just to see what sort of an impact it will have on prices. Like if today's um, outage of the of the uh, Kirkuk Chaihan pipeline, um, if this kind of progresses for a for a longer period of time, that would mean that there would be lesser availability of crude for the Mediterranean. They've already been impacted by the Kazakhstan outage, by the Libyan outage. This adds further complexity to refiners in the Mediterranean. So these sort of issues will be more keenly observed by the market. Um, and if we move to the slide on the Chinese stocks, like I mentioned, everywhere except for commercial storage in Shandong, we've seen stocks being drawn down. In Shandong, they've been fairly stable. Uh, we've seen the refinery run rates uh, kind of moderating. I think the reason here has been slightly different. It's been more about the policy the government has undertaken towards independent refiners. The Chinese government looks to rationalize the entire refinery sector, um, kind of consolidating it into uh, into an industry where there's more control. Um, so eventually, 
I think the expectation would be that instead of having multiple small companies, there would be three or four large independent refiners who are integrated and have complexes which you know produce from fuels to petrochemicals, sort of an integration. So the policy has been towards that extent. They've they've made it difficult for them to use alternative feedstock like um, straight run fuel oil or for that matter mexilines. Um, they also made it difficult from a taxation perspective, a tax avoidance perspective. They've reduced their crude oil import quotas. So um, overall, I think directionally, the government is sending messages to the market that, you know, the there'll be only like two participants in the Chinese refining sector. One would be the state companies. The other would be large integrated companies. The smaller companies will either wind up or will get... Uh, kind of bought out by one of these um, setups. So I think that has been the reason why stocks in Shandong have been relatively stable, have not fallen as much as uh, other places have. And in fact, in some cases, we've also seen increase in stocks. So that's the only exception, but globally, we've seen uh, crude oil inventories fall everywhere. Yeah. Okay, let's... Uh... Let's take it forward. I mean, to, to had a good look at a, quite a few factors, supply demand side and key price influences. I'm going to take a look at this slide because it just gives us a take on where the market stands at the moment. And uh, it'd be better to ask on that. Um, you know, we discussed there's a lot of talk around $100 Brent at the moment. And I think as we're kind of almost aligned there, solution, uh, I think that appears to be achievable in the event there is a confluence of supply shocks um, taken into account in Turkey's pipeline vouchers today. You know, that confluence uh, with, without an OPEC response, obviously, uh, is probably creates a scenario where $100 might be achievable, but again, uh, it's probably not sustainable. And these price forecasts or estimates from across the market, along with the supply demand forecast from the IEA, uh, I think really support that. Um, you know, the core reason for that is the ample spare capacity in the Middle East. So we might be divided on how willing or unwilling uh, certain players are to tap into that and in what time frame. Um, but uh, you know, that could be bought online to contain prices, and I think the chances are there would be significant fiscal pressure to do so. Um, as such, I don't think anybody's getting particularly overexcited. Uh, with their long-term price forecasts anyway. The top charts up there, or the top two charts there, show polls by Reuters of 32 analysts in the marketplace. The chart left on top, that gives quarterly projections for 2022, and then we're slightly longer term out to 2026 on the right-hand side. Now, short term, uh, the consensus puts Brent price averages at around $75, $75.5 in the first quarter of this year with highs of the range at 85. Um, so we're, we're already above that now. And then moving into the second quarter, the consensus softens slightly uh, at $75 or close to it, um, with a high at 95 in the second quarter. So perhaps uh, some more space for volatility there. But uh, yeah, a wide spread there um, in terms of price estimates. And I think this correlates, or at least the base case in the blue line, it correlates loosely uh, with the EIA monthly supply demand forecasts with the supply deficits charted for you on the bottom left hand side there. Um, and what we see is that, so I guess on aggregate anyway, a relative balance in the first quarter, the first three months, uh, and then moving into a, a supply surplus into the second and third quarters and into the second half of the year. Um, but uh, yeah, given the fundamental forecasts, uh, which have consistently underestimated the, the, def the deficit, which continues to persist. You, know, you have to wonder whether or not uh, we should be concerned about the price estimates uh, being on the low side as well. But uh, we'll keep an eye on things and uh, we'll uh, be with you again in February uh, for another update. So join us then. Thanks very much. Yeah.